Thank you, everyone, for coming. Those of you who do not know who I am, I'm Arvin Varsani. I'm kind of all over campus, lingering around. If you see me in shorts and sandals, I'm one of the students. I do try to blend in. Um, other than that, uh, it's, it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce you to Mark, who comes to us from Colorado State University. And Mark's got a very varied training. Just like me, he's kind of been all over the place in different areas. And that's kind of beautiful because it brings different facets of science together. So his background training is in biochemistry. And then from there, uh, he's done a bit of training with data science and spent six years in industry, in aerospace industry, writing a whole lot of code. And then has come back to science and worked with innate immunity and antiviral defenses. Um, and then now actually does some really exciting stuff uh, with viruses in a variety of different animals, including reptiles. And he's going to show us, uh, present to us some of his really unique work on exotic animals. And indirectly, I said, we can probably call them exotic viruses, if anything, because they are being trafficked around with uh, pet trade. OK, with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Arvind. And um, thank you for the invitation to come speak here. It's a great opportunity to um, talk to you all. And I am will tell you today about, I've switched my talk title to the rewarding study of exotic animal viruses, because I thought exotic was a better adjective than obscure. And also, as you may know, veterinarians refer to animals like birds and reptiles as exotics. And in fact, the, <clears throat> the virus and the disease that I'm going to talk to you today is a, a virus of, of snakes. So um, there's this disease called inclusion body disease that has been known to veterinarians for several decades and has been a real vexing problem in captive snake collections and zoos and places like that. Um, it's, it's characterized probably um, most by these neurologic symptoms that you can see displayed here. So um, here, this is a boa constrictor that's literally tied itself into knots that's been diagnosed with the disease, this disease. And you don't have to be a herpetologist to know that this is not like a super smart strategy for a snake. Um, <clears throat> and here is a, um, here's a video of a, sorry about the volume there. Turn that down. Um, here's a video of a, of a snake that's also been diagnosed with IBD, inclusion body disease, and it's exhibiting this really characteristic stargazing behavior where it kind of, kind of loses motor control, becomes paralyzed on the lower part of its body, and kind of points its head up at the sky, which is why it's called stargazing. So if, you, if a veterinarian sees a snake stargazing, it's, the veterinarian is going to assume that it's afflicted with inclusion body disease, but the actual diagnosis is based uh, histologically on the presence of these inclusions in the cytoplasms of cells. And that's where the disease gets its name, obviously. So this is a, um, a stained kidney section from a snake with IBD. And you can see these really large eosinophilic inclusions um, that are bigger than the nuclei in cells of this snake. And if you look in tissues throughout the whole snake, you see these inclusions. And it's really quite striking. Um, I actually took this image myself. and. It's just amazing to look at these tissue sections because they're just like chocked full of these really huge inclusions. So this is how the, the traditional basis for diagnosis for this disease. And although it's been known about for several decades, really veterinarians, and there was evidence that it was transmissible, veterans, veterinarians really had no idea what the causative agent was. It was thought for a long time that it was a retrovirus. <clears throat> but no definitive um, causal association with a pathogen could be established. So, and this project started back when I was a postdoc about five years ago when I was doing a variety of pathogen discovery projects using metagenomic sequencing. So this is using next generation sequencing to try to identify pathogens in association with infectious diseases. And basically the way this works is you take case and control tissues um, and extract nucleic acid from the disease tissues. The, the sort of underlying hypothesis is that if there's an infectious agent causing a disease, you ought to be able to detect its nucleic acid amongst all of the host nucleic acid. So you make a sequencing library, sequence it, um, and do some computational analyses that I'm not really going to talk about to try to identify the pathogen sequence. So this is pretty standard, I think, now for many people to understand this. Um, and really, what I'm going to be talking about today is more the follow-up. Because if you identify um, a pathogen sequence, there's, that's really just the beginning of the story. And so I'm going to tell you the rest of the story that followed from that. So when I did this for this inclusion body disease, I found something pretty unexpected, which is that there is uh, what looked to be arenavirus sequences in these um, 
in these snakes in cases of inclusion body disease, but not in control samples. So arenaviruses were previously only known to infect uh, rodents and other mammals. So um, there's, and there's two, there, previously there was known to be two major clades of arenaviruses called old, old world and new world arenaviruses. These infected rodents in, in the old world in Africa and rodents in the new world in the Americas. And some of these are sort of famous human, well, they're, they're, they're natural host are rodents, but when they're transmitted zoonotically to humans, they can cause some serious disease. So probably most famously, uh, there's Lassa virus in, in Africa, you may have heard of. That's an old world arena virus. And there's about <clears throat> 500,000 cases of Lassa fever every year in Africans who are exposed to infected rodents. And those, in some cases, about 1% of the cases, that progresses to Lassa hemorrhagic fever. So it's kind of a nasty, some of these viruses can cause like a nasty sort of Ebola-like disease in humans. And that was kind of primarily what they were known for. And what we found was there's this entirely new lineage of arena viruses that infects snakes. The, these viruses have a segmented genome. They have two genome segments of single-stranded RNA, um, a large, an L, and a small S genome segment that each encode two genes in opposite coding orientations. And <clears throat> the sort of, although their genome organization was largely similar to the rodent arenaviruses, one striking feature of these new snake viruses was that one of their genes, the glycoprotein gene, that encodes these, the surface glycoprotein of this virus, was more, had no detectable sequence similarity to the glycoproteins of other arenaviruses. Instead, it was more similar to glycoprotein genes from phyloviruses like Ebola virus and, other, and some other viruses like retroviruses. And this is based on a phylogenetic similar, or sequence um, analysis as well as a structural similarity. So this is a superimposition of the uh, glycoprotein crystal structure from one of these snake viruses with the Marburg virus glycoprotein, and they're basically superimposable. So that was sort of an interesting aspect of the sort of genomic structure of these viruses, and it suggested that in some kind of distant past, um, in the distant evolutionary history of these viruses, there may have been a recombination event between an arena-like virus and a, perhaps a phyllo-like virus that led to these, uh, these snake viruses. So. Like I mentioned before, um, identification of a sequence is just that. It's just a sequence. It doesn't really do, tell you anything about disease causality or really, um, it, doesn't, it definitely doesn't prove disease causality. So you have to do a number of additional experiments if you want to do that. And so <clears throat> some of the work that we've done um, is to establish a, a continuous cell line of bow constrictor cells to, in which we can replicate the virus. So this is just looking at viral RNA over time after these cells have been inoculated with virus, and doing things like generating antibodies against viral proteins to be able to detect the virus growing in those cells. And what you can see is that, um, that if you take this uh, antibody that stains the viral nuclear protein, you can see that it stains the same inclusions that have been the traditional pathologic basis for diagnosis of disease. So if you look at the inclusions of inclusion body disease, they contain viral protein. So that's pretty strong circumstantial evidence along with the correlation to cases and not controls that this virus causes disease, but it doesn't prove it. So to prove it, <clears throat> um, we actually initiated experimental infection studies to, as sort of a formal proof of disease causality. And this was a big collaboration that um, began several years ago with, uh, with veterinarians at UC Davis, as well as people from my lab at CSU. Um, and what we did is infected these snakes, uh, boa constrictors and ball pythons, with um, infectious virus, five times 10 to the fifth units of infectious virus by injecting it into their heart, which is the way that you administer things into the blood of snakes. Um, and <clears throat> we did it in these two different snake species because there had been sort of anecdotal historical reports from veterinarians that boas, boa snakes in the boaidae family like boa constrictors um, were less susceptible to disease than pythons and other, like ball pythons and other pythons in the python family. So we kind of wanted to assess disease susceptibility in these two different types of snakes. And <clears throat> what we found was um, basically in agreement with this sort of traditional anecdotal belief that was among veterinarians. So um, what we did is we infected the boa constrictors and let them go 
and let them go and let them go. So we kind of kept waiting for them to get sick, but they just kept being totally healthy. And we actually let them go for two years. So although this study was um, initiated in 2014, we just recently published it because of the long time course that we ended up going with. And so we periodically took biopsies and blood samples from the snakes. And um, we were able to detect virus replication, which I'll show you in a minute. But the snakes were completely healthy, the boa constrictors. For two years, not a sign of disease, although they were really infected. Um, in contrast, and then so we euthanized them after two years because that was the sort of planned course of the study. In contrast, the ball pythons got sick pretty quickly. So within two months of infection, the ball pythons that we infected started exhibiting <coughs> sort of these severe neurologic signs, and they had to be euthanized because of our animal care protocol. Um, but just after two months, they started <coughs> exhibiting signs that I'll show you in this video. Um, so you can see that they're sort of this snake is basically paralyzed um, in the lower half of its body, and it's doing basically the same stargazing behavior where it's, it's basically lost motor control in the um, upper part of its body. Um, so, and this is not a normal behavior of snakes. Further on in this video, I'll show you. We have um, control snakes, and, and they... They basically, it's pretty hard to normally put a snake on its back. Um, so this is what this, this part of the video will show you. So this is me with some, these are, they're all ball pythons, even though those were yellow and these ones are greens, they're just of different colors. And basically, I'm trying to put, these are healthy, uninfected ball pythons. They just, you can't put them on your, their back. I mean, you, this, I'm not, in this video, the purpose of this is, to, is me trying to put them on their back and they're just like, uh-uh, I don't want to go on my back. So that's what a normal ball python looks like. So although the boa constrictors were healthy, they were really infected with virus. And they were maintaining really high viral loads throughout the two years of infection. So here I'm showing you uh, viral, RNA, or viral RNA in the blood of these boa constrictors across the two years of infection. And they had really high levels of viremia throughout the infection. So up to 10 to the 10th copies of viral RNA per mill of blood throughout the course of infection. And they had really huge inclusions in tissues throughout their body. So um, these are uh, tissue, brain tissues from the infected boa constrictors, and here's an uninfected control. And you can see that if you look in the neurons of these boa constrictors, they had huge inclusions in like every single neuron that you looked in. So they were definitely infected and infected throughout their body, including their central nervous system. In contrast, the pythons, the only place we could detect viral replication was in their central nervous system. Um, so here I'm showing you a um, tissue sec this is a this is a brain section from one of the infected ball pythons. And you can see that there are sporadic uh, cells in the brain that are infected. And you can see that there are, um, in contrast to the boa constrictors where you could see those characteristic inclusions, the ball pythons actually didn't have inclusions. Instead, you, you couldn't see inclusions histologically. And when you stain for viral protein, it was more of this speckled cytoplasmic uh, appearance. So this was really different than the boa constrictors where they, they were systemically infected. Every, every tissue that we looked at had evidence of our replication and there were inclusions. In the ball pythons, there was um, only infection in the central nervous system and there in fact weren't inclusions, although they were suffering from the sort of characteristic symptoms of inclusion body disease. The other kind of major difference between the boa constrictors and the ball pythons is that the in the boa constrictors, there was no inflammation anywhere that we could see. So there was no evidence of an active immune response against the viruses. Despite the fact that there was massive viral replication and infection everywhere, the boa constrictors, you could see no inflammation. The in the ball pythons, you could see inflammation um, in the sites of viral replication. So in the brain, you could see these uh, inf inflammatory infiltrates in the brains of the infected ball pythons. So that was another pretty big difference between the two different types of snakes. So <clears throat> there was some conclusiveness from the studies, but a lot of remaining questions. So we, we demonstrated that a renovirus infection actually causes inclusion body disease and inclusions. But inclusions, despite the name of the disease, inclusions are not required for disease, and they're not necessarily associated with disease. I think um, an interesting open question is, is why the two different types of snake respond so differently to infection? Why is there such a different tissue tropism and immune response? 
And uh, another sort of outstanding question is whether the boa constrictors would have eventually gone on to develop the disease. This is probably, probably they would have. We know that veterinarians see a lot of boa constrictors with inclusion of body disease, but, but clearly it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's an infection that they're able to tolerate for a lot longer than the pythons. So the next steps uh, that we're thinking about pursuing are looking at vaccines uh, for, uh, for this disease. And we're also particularly interested in trying to identify the cellular receptors um, for these viruses and trying to understand if that might be the basis for the differential uh, difference in tropism in the two different types of snakes. So that's, um, that's sort of the, where we've gone with the ident following the ident identification of this new type of virus is to show disease causality. And another sort of direction that this project has gone is to look at the sort of population level diversity of these viruses. And the, the, the sort of way this came about is that we, we received a fairly steady stream of snakes um, from veterinarians, from private owners, from zookeepers. And um, we've been testing a lot of those for infection to try to get a, a handle on the sort of population level diversity of these viruses and to try to understand whether there's any connection between viral genotype and disease outcome. So these are an example of some of the samples we get. This is a, a frozen dead Dumeril's boa um, that showed up in a box in a Walmart bag. Um, these are uh, Burmese python heads from the Florida Everglades. You may know that Burmese pythons are invasive in the Florida Everglades. And um, there's even been bounties for Burmese python captures in Florida. And to get the bounty, all you have to do is bring in a head, because they don't want, some of these are really huge snakes. So basically, people go around, and they kill these, and they chop off their heads. And we've received some of these. Um, some of them are really kind of scarily large. Um, so here's some Burmese python heads that we've tested. But we've tested lots of different um, snakes and done complete genome sequencing on the infected ones. And we've looked at 48 infected snakes and done characterized the whole viral genome for those. And what we found was um, really a level of, of genetic diversity that, we were, that was totally unexpected and that was really took some forms that we were completely unanticipated. Um, so before I tell you about that, I'll just remind maybe some of the people who don't think about viruses and virus evolution every day about the, the major ways that viruses and their genomes can evolve. So there's basically three molecular mechanisms that drive uh, viral evolution. Um, so mutation or combination and resortment. So mutation is simply what you'd expect in an infected cell. Viral genomes can originate with mutations, and those can go on in the progeny. That's sort of straightforward, basically like point mutations. Um, in a co-infected cell, though, you can have recombination and reassortment. So in a, in, a, in a cell that's been co-infected by two different genotypes of virus, you can have, during viral genome replication, you can have template switching events that produce chimeric progeny genomes. So if you have a red and a blue virus infecting this one cell, you can have these template switching events during copying of the genome, and you can get these chimeric red-blue or blue-red genome segments. So that's recombination. Reassortment, as you, most of you probably already know, occurs when you have co-infection of a segmented virus like arenaviruses. In that case, in a co-infected cell, you can have um, basically a combinatorial shuffling of the parental genome segments so that any progeny virus that's coming out of this infected cell can have any combination of the genome segments from either of the parental viruses. So that's reassortment. This is particularly important in viruses like influenza. This is sort of like the best characterized virus. Um, reassortment is well, very well characterized in influenza, but really it can impact any kind of segmented uh, virus. So I'll, I'm going to show you what we found in the uh, infected, 48 infected snakes using a data format like this. It's sort of these heat maps, one for the S segment and one for the L segment. That's the small and the large segment. And there'll be a column for each virus genotype and a row for each different, for each snake. And so you, you can see here in snakes one, and then the color coding is just the fractional abundance of the different genotypes. And you can, so snakes one and two are singly infected snakes. Um, as are four and five. Snake three would be a co-infected snake with two different S segments and two different L segments. And then snakes four and five are singly infected, but they're reassorted relative to each other because they have the same S segment genotype and different L segment genotypes. So that's how this data will be presented. 
So in, in 21 of the 48 snakes, there was evidence of single infection. So there was, here's the snakes one through six. And when, whenever you see these little uh, brackets, that means those particular snakes were from the same collection and they were co-housed together. So these snakes, it's sort of straightforward. They have one L S segment and one L segment. Um, we don't detect viral sequences in our control samples. That's sort of straightforward. Um, we also found lots of evidence for reassortment in the singly infected snake. So here, for instance, if you look at um, snakes six and seven, they have different S segments, but the same L segments. And if you look at all of the singly infected snakes, all 21, you can see there's a lot of evidence of reassortment. So all of these snakes have the same um, S segment genotype, but they have four different L segments in association with that. So there's a, a sort of high degree of reassortment in the singly infected snakes. But that was only 21 of the 48 snakes. And in more than 50% of the snakes, we found evidence for, for co-infections or multiple infections. So here's a snake, snake number 45, where there's a co-infection. You have two different S-segment genotypes and two different L-segment genotypes. That could be a straightforward kind of co-infection scenario. Um, but what we found in the rest of the multiply infected snakes was actually far more complicated than that. So here is an example of another three of the multiply infected snakes. Now we only have one S-segment genotype that's now in combination with sort of these various combinations of L-segment genotypes where it's just sort of all over the place. And when you look at all of the multiply infected snakes, you can see this really kind of crazy pattern of, um, of different assortments of different genome segments in the individual infected snakes. Question? How are you distinguishing uh, co-infection from quasi-species? Yeah, so the, the, threshold the threshold for calling them different genotypes is they have to have less than 80% nucleotide pairwise identity. And the average between the genotypes was only 65% pairwise identity. So that is not consistent with intrahost diversification. They're like really different genotypes of virus. Like a, you, could, you could call them species. That's basically the, uh, about what you would call a different species of virus. So, so really there was just this amazing assortment of different, um, of different genotypes and in individual viruses. And... <clears throat> um, the, the, the winner was snake 34 that had four different S-segment genotypes and 11 different L-segment genotypes. And, um, and so this was, this was, this was really quite, quite surprising. Um, another kind of feature of this data is that where, as you see, lots, there was always more different L-segment genotypes in individual snakes than there was S-segment genotypes. And in fact, in most of the snakes, there's only, there only one S-segment. And most of the time, it was this particular S-segment segment that we called segment gen genotype number six. So uh, this was really, it took a really long time to actually parse the sequencing data and figure out that this was going on. And it was frankly not believable in the beginning. I, I had a really hard time believing that something this unexpected is what was actually happening. And so we did a number of things to try to confirm this using independent approaches. So one thing we did was design uh, PCR assays for these different genotypes and go back to the original samples and use PCR to the discriminate between the different genotypes to show using that that there was actually these co-infections and multiple infections going on. The other thing we did was use isolation by going back to the original tissue sections, making homogenates, putting them on the uh, snake cell line and then growing the virus that came out of the tissue samples and showing that you could actually isolate um, these viruses that were actually populations of different um, genome segments from the same tissue section. And so here you can see a virus uh, that was isolated from a single tissue of a snake replicating in culture and you can see that it has one S-segment genotype and a sort of ensemble of five different L-segment genotypes all coming from the same tissue sample. Um, the other thing we found is that, as you might predict with this level of co-infection, there was a lot of evidence of recombination. So here's an example of a recombinant genome segment where you have the, um, the glycoprotein gene coming um, from one genotype and the nucleoprotein gene coming from a completely different genotype. So this is a recombinant genome segment. And um, the way I'm showing this data is that the, the gray kind of filled in area here is the coverage of that genome segment. So these, these recombinant junctions were well supported by the next-gen sequencing data and were confirmed by PCR and sequencing, Sanger sequencing across the breakpoints. 
And then this red and black line is actually the predicted secondary structure of windows across the genome segment. And arenaviruses have these two genes in the opposite coding orientations, and then they have this intergenic region with a big hairpin in the middle of it. And, um, and that's what this, this little peak of secondary structure is, represents here. The, so recombination might have been expected, but what we really weren't expecting was these really unusual genome segments like this. So this was a, um, and we found about six different examples of genome segments like this. So this is a, 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 a genome segment where you have um, a recombination, but it didn't, the recombination did not happen in the same, like just in the intergenic region between the two genome segments. Now the recombination happened in a way that produced a partial L segment sequence and a partial Z segment sequence, and the breakpoint happened in between them. So now we have this weird genome segment that's like five or 600 nucleotides longer than the typical genome segments, and it has this whole extra bit in the middle and two intergenic regions now um, between the two genome segments. And the way that this might have happened is that <clears throat> if recombination happened in a situation like this where if you had a co-infection with two different L segments, you had uh, initiation of genome replication coming across through the intergenic region of this genome segment, and then you had a disassociation template switching to another genome segment, and then completion of replication on the last bit of this genome, you'd end up with a chimeric recombinant genome segment like this. So this was really pretty unusual because there's a sort of dogmatic belief in, in RNA virology that viruses have are very streamlined, right? They don't have extra content. They, they're as efficient as possible. They, they're, because of the replication dynamics, they can't tolerate kind of extra stuff like this that doesn't probably encode functional proteins. So it's kind of surprising to find um, a, a genome segment with such an unusual organization with this extra, extra stuff in the middle. And in, in fact, though, this genome segment um, was detected in multiple snakes that were housed together, so it was capable of transmission and it was being maintained even in multiple infected snakes, suggesting it wasn't completely unfit from a competitive standpoint. And you could um, isolate it in culture. So here is a replication of that genome segment in culture using primers um, from two different segments across the genome, one that bridges this recombination junction. You can see that basically this, this genome segment replicates stably in culture. So that was fairly surprising. So, so this was kind of weird, and, and the question is, what's going on? What's causing this really startling and unexpected degree of genetic diversity? And to kind of get at that and sort of to, as a segue to provide you with sort of an overarching hypothesis of what I think might be going on, I'm going to tell you this sort of last component of the story, which is the story of Princess Diamond, um, which will make more sense in a minute. So this part of the story started... Um, back uh, last year when I got an email from a vet in Brazil, and he said, hey, we got this snake. We think it has inclusion body disease. Would you mind testing it for us? And yeah, I said, sure, of course, we'd be happy to, to test your sample for us. We, do, we get a lot of samples. We test a lot of samples for, for random veterinarians and other people. And he had sent us this image of the histopathology they'd done, and you can see that there's these inclusions in the tissue. This is a kidney section from one of the snakes. And, it sure looked like inclusion body disease, so we said, sure, we haven't tested any snakes from Brazil. We'd be happy to look at it for you. So we got it, and this work was done by Mary Lee Layton, who is in my lab. And um, so she tested. We actually got samples from five snakes from Brazil. Um, they actually got held up in customs for 10 days, so by the time we got them, they were, like, really gross. Nevertheless, we got RNA out of the samples and could detect the virus, which I was kind of surprised by. And they were virus positive by um, PCR, Sanger sequencing, and next-gen sequencing, and we obtained complete viral genomes and reported the results back to the, the Dr. De Castro, the veterinarian in Brazil. And, you know, that was kind of, um, I thought, maybe perhaps the end of the story. But then when I was going to respond to his email to tell him what happened, I kind of reread his email more carefully. And I saw this part, that the snakes are imported in, from the U.S., and we are concerned that the... Um, they could spread to wildlife. And I was like, a boa constrictor imported from the U.S. into Brazil? That seems kind of weird. So <clears throat> because boa constrictors and, and other, basically most snakes, um, are mostly imported into the U.S. And um, that's driven, so there's about 100,000 boa constrictors per year imported into the U.S. And that's, that's just in part to supply the reptile 
trade um, in this country, but it's also driven by this demand for no novel color morphs. So color morphs are based are what people call, snake collectors call snakes of different colors. Um, so here's a poster um, of boa constrictor color morphs, and you can see that they have these really cool different colorations with really cool names like blood and jungle. Um, and you know, snake collectors are really into different colored snakes, basically. So these, a lot of these colorations probably arose as adaptations to different natural environments. And so people who go and collect wild snakes can bring them into this country and sell them for a lot of money. And so I emailed Mars, the, the vet, and I said, why, why, why were these snakes brought into the US? And he said, he sent this back, and he's like, was trapped in the US, and I was just became very expensive and famous, the, and then something about Interpol, and I was just like, what is going on? <laughs> so, so I like immediately started Googling and came across this like crazy story about what these snakes actually were. So the story starts back in 2006, um, and there were some uh, firefighters in Rio de Janeiro, and they found this, this is actually a picture of the snake they found, um, and this is a, uh, it was a wild snake that they, they found, and it's called leucistic. So this is, um, this is a, leucistic is sort of like albino. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a genetic um, anomaly where the snake is completely white. And obviously for, um, for snake collectors, a, a completely white snake like this would be really valuable. In fact, that specialist values the specimen at $350,000 to $1 million. So a really valuable, expensive snake. And um, the snake got, uh, got transmitted to uh, a zoo in Rio de Janeiro. But then in 2011, the, the zoo closed. And when the sort of authorities went to go talk to the people who were in charge of the zoo, the, the people said, oh, yeah, oh, that snake died. We don't have that snake anymore. And they were kind of like, oh, that's kind of shady. And <clears throat> right around that same time, completely coincidentally, um, a snake breeder, this guy, in Utah, um, he he obtained a sus what this is from a news story. Obtained a sus suspiciously similar looking bo uh, boa constrictor, um, which he named Princess Diamond. And so, <clears throat> um, so in 2011, right when that zoo was closing in Brazil, this guy began offering uh, Princess Diamond snakes for sale. From you know, these are offspring of this snake for twelve thousand to twenty-five thousand dollars. So um, this person was obviously profiting a lot from these albino snakes. But he insisted, oh, no, that's not that snake. This is, I got, this is a different snake. Um, but people obviously didn't really believe him because these snakes are so rare. Um, and so the, he, he began to be investigated by the authorities. And they found some really suspicious things. So for instance, um, one of his, in his sort of his immigration and customs records, they found that he had um, visited that zoo in 2006, right when the snake got there, and then he'd again visited in 2009. And in his second trip, the way he went into Brazil was through Guiana, up in the middle of nowhere in Brazil in the Amazon, and he actually crossed into the Amazon across the border in this little jungle town, and <clears throat> stayed for one day. So you know, as this news story says, this trip raised red flags because this did not make sense for me. Why would this guy come to Brazil and spend just a day in a little village in the middle of the Amazon? Seems like a reasonable question to ask, right? But the story gets even weirder. So, um, so he had also, he, he did this trip with his sister. He had also been caught, his sister had been caught going across the border wearing a fake hollow pregnancy belly. So they, you know, they saw this thing, something that must have looked suspicious about like her fake belly. And they interviewed her, and there was nothing in her belly, but you can, might be able to assume that she was going to smuggle the snake out in her fake hollow pregnancy bellow, bellow, hollow pregnancy belly. So finally, you know, obviously, like everything is kind of closing in on this, like this story, and um, and they looked at the phone records of the zoo administrator, and she had been in that small little village at the same time as Stone this guy, Jeremy Stone, and also he had you know, sent her $250,000 by wire transfer. So in 2015, he, um, he pled guilty to importation of illegal wildlife into the United States. So he basically got caught and pled guilty. And, um, and in fact, the, the part of the plea agreement, so his plea agreement in, in pleading guilty, he 
he had to be confined to his home for one year, and he had to, to repatriate the offspring of this snake to Brazil. Um, he claimed that the original snake had died. This is another, the snake keeps dying mysteriously. Um, so anyway, uh, those repatriated snakes are actually the samples that we got from this, this, this zoo in Brazil. So the snakes went back to Brazil, and um, one of them died after being, or actually while it was quarantined, um, after coming back to Brazil. And then it was diagnosed in this postmortem uh, exam where I showed you the histopathology before with IBD, and those were actually the samples we got. So the, we got samples from five of the descendants. They, they all tested positive um, and were infected. And the virus genome sequences are most closely related to ones we'd identified in snakes um, in the U.S. before, snakes from Louisiana, actually. So it seems that, um, that while the, the snakes were in the U.S., they actually got in, infected with arena viruses. We know that boa constrictors can be subclinically infected. They got sent back to Brazil, and now they're all infected. So that's like, thank you. That's our, the final sort of thank you to Brazil. The sort of dis, one sort of dispiriting aspect of the story is that this guy is still going strong, and, and surprise, surprise, he's still selling completely white boa constrictors. So if you go to Facebook, you, and you can, the name of his Facebook page is called boaconstrictor.com. You can go there today and contact him about buying these snakes. And he's bragging about how this is one of the white snakes. He's selling it. He's shipping it to Germany. He has this picture on his Facebook page. These are snakes that now he's sending off to all around the world. Um, so although he was you know, pled guilty and ostensibly punished, it didn't seem to have made much of an impact on his operation. So, so just to kind of, so I'm going to kind of sum this all up with what I think is happening. But just to recap, um, so a previously unknown lineage of arena viruses infect snakes and are the cause of inclusion by disease. Um, boa constrictors, we know, can be subclinically infected for years. Um, and there's obviously no barrier to superinfection because snakes can become multiply infected. Some data that I didn't show you is that we've shown that, that snake, that viruses can either be transmitted horizontally. And there's another publication that snakes can be transmitted vertically from parents to offspring which are both ways that the, the virus could be maintained and accumulate in these collections. Um, infections in individual snakes are characterized by really sort of surprisingly high levels of co-infection as well as recombination, including some recombinant forms that have these really highly unusual uh, genome architectures with sort of extra content in them. There's, a, there's an enormous amount of reassortment and I think something that's, that I'm particularly interested in, there's, there's possible differences in the evolutionary trajectories of the S and, cell, S and L segments. So, so what I mean is that if you look at this chart, there appears to be a maintenance of genetic diversity among the L segment of these viruses. There's a large number of L segments in many snakes. There's 23 L genotypes that are still maintained. Um, and in contrast to that, there appears to be a consolidation of genetic diversity in the S segments. So we've only, we've only observed 11 different genotypes of the S segment in contrast to the 23 different L genotypes that we've identified. And most snakes only have a single S segment genotype. And in most cases, it's just this one S segment genotype, which one interpretation of this data is that this is sort of the most fit genotype of the S segment that's, that may be... Um, that may be sort of uh, in the middle. This is speculative because we don't have data about wild genotypes of the virus, but it may be involved in a, in a selective sweep towards dominance of the population. So what's going on? Um, well, another kind of piece of information that you may or may not know is that the reptile breeders do not have, like, do not have the best um, infectious disease control practices, you could say. And the way that they do snake breeding is in situations like this. So this is actually that same guy. Um, a picture from his website um, of him holding a snake in a cool way. And you can see that they, they literally stack uh, snakes in containers from floor to ceiling in these breeding operations. And in, in, in each of these individual cages, there could be a whole hatch of snakes, so like a dozen snakes co-housed in one of these things. There's no quarantine. There's no testing. Um, and snake breeders bring their snakes to these reptile expos where they trade them. They bring them together. Um, in sort of close proximity. So all of this could be creating an environment where all of this um, mixing and evolution is happening. So 
mammal mammarina viruses, which are the mammalian infecting arena viruses, there's there's a little bit more. Actually, there's a lot more known about the the natural hosts and the the sort of natural distribution of these viruses. And what's known about mammal infecting arena viruses is that in the wild they've co-evolved with the rodents um, in the old world and the new world in these sort of geographically segregated uh, ecological niches. And so individual viruses have co-evolved with their individual rodent hosts in different parts of the world. Um, whether that's true for arena viruses is unknown because there's no data about the, the natural hosts or the natural distribution of these viruses, but it's, it's plausible to assume that a similar thing has happened with snake infecting arena viruses and that they have evolved um, with, their, uh, with snakes in different geographically segregated regions of, like in, in, for instance, in particular in boas, in different um, boa populations in different parts of Central and South America and co-evolved with their hosts in that way. And what may be happening is that reptile trafficking and breeding practices have created a situation where there's pr these sort of previously segregated and separated independently evolving populations of viruses are now being brought together in captivity, mixed in this way that's, uh, that's sort of fostered by the, the practices, the human practices, as well as the biology of the virus, where there's no barriers to superinfection, there's vertical and horizontal transmission, there's subclinical infections. All of these may be sort of contributing to the situation where we're having this really um, sort of um, disruptive evolution of this group of viruses. This is obviously a hypothesis because, like I said, there's nothing known about the um, natural hosts or... Uh, or genetics of these viruses, so that's something that I'm particularly interested in following up on. And if, if any of you happen to do field work in Central or South America and have access to samples, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you about that, because it's something that I'm really interested in pursuing to sort of move this beyond hypothesis. So, <clears throat> um, so that's what I have. I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab at Colorado State who have done this work, as well as all of our collaborators um, at different institutions, and um, thank you for your attention. I have two questions. First of all, so the first question is, on top of that, you also have predator and prey both having arena viruses. If you right. compare the arena viruses in the snakes and the arena viruses in the mammalian species, do you expect any overlap or any um, co-evolution of viruses in both species? Yeah, it's a, it's it's possible. Um, so the these arena viruses, these snake infecting arena viruses, will infect mammalian cell lines, but only at a lower at like a 30 degrees C, so a non-mammalian kind of normal body temperature. Um, so there does seem to be some sort of temperature sensitivity to these viruses, which suggests that they don't replicate in mammalian cells. And we have, I have looked a little bit. Um, so they've never been identified in any kind of rodent sample. I've looked at, I've actually looked at feed rodents that you can buy at like PetSmart. Um, and I didn't find any of the snake arena viruses in any of those feed rodents, but I did find LCMV which is a pathogenic mammalian arena virus. And some, I, so like these little pinky mice that you can buy at um, PetSmart, I found one of those that was like blazingly positive for LCMV, which is a human pathogen. And so that was slightly alarming and we, we alerted the Department of Health. But there's no evidence that that's possible. <laughs> so my lab does work on LCMV. Okay. In, in the LCMV system, uh -huh. Chronicity or persistent infection always segregates with the S segment. Uh -huh. In particular, mutations in the selective mutations in the glycoprotein. Uh -huh. Your data would also suggest that the the co-infection is a longer-term infections that they're getting super infected over time, and that there's the same kind of bottleneck. Do you have you taken virus <clears throat> from? from the other S segments mm -hmm. and compared how long the infection lasts in, in subsequent infections. Yeah, so the, the BOA constrictors were, um, were infected with, okay, let me just make sure I get this right. So the BOA constrictors were infected, the ball pythons were infected with two different genotypes of virus that both produce the same clinical outcome. The BOA constrictors were only infected with one genotype of virus that had a particular S segment genotype that 
is not the one that's the most commonly observed one, and that also had a very... So that would be the, the interesting experiment, is take the one that, that is in those multiply infected yeah. uh, hosts, take that genotype, uh, G, gly, uh, glycoprotein, and do yeah. the infections. Yeah, so far there's no evidence that there's any relationship between viral genotype and clinical outcome, but it's very limited data. My, my apologies if you actually covered this and I missed it, but did you ever determine exactly why the boas can carry the virus but not show the symptoms? No, I mean, my feeling is it has something to do with the, the, the virus is, is immunosuppressing, um, probably the boa constrictors, um, because of the complete lack of inflammation. It, and this is known for mammal infecting arenaviruses, that there's this immunosuppressive effect that you can map to a particular viral protein. So probably the ho the, the bow constrictors are tolerating infection because they're being because of the immunosuppressive activity of the virus. And so it's sort of I don't know if you could describe it as masking infection. Um, I, I also think that it's th that that sort of behavior is consistent with bow constrictors being a reservoir species for this virus in the wild. That's sort of a classic um, I guess what you uh, outcome of a of a reservoir virus interaction where the reservoir can tolerate infection. The other thing I didn't mention is that the the bow constrictors were shedding virus the whole time they're infected. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Um, so this kind of relates to the trafficking of animals and mm -hmm. trade, but there is another aspect that we've you haven't touched on, and that is release of these animals once they become a burden to the owner. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've seen with parrots when we worked with parrots and diseases in parrots, where a lot of the breeders will bring a variety of different species, put them into a single aviary, and you've got an awesome transmission chain that's taking place. And then they go out to other people, and people buy them, and at some point people are like, we want to actually free these birds and release them into the environment. Mm. And so these exotic birds are then breeding, interacting with endemic birds, and you've got a transmission chain taking place mm. there. So with the, and this leads to the question with, with the Burmese pythons, mm. do you see a higher diversity of arena viruses in the Burmese pythons? Because those have actually come from different breeding facilities, and there is, oh, most of them are then released into the environment. And within the Florida Everglades, they're breeding with other released animals mm -hmm. and so there you've got a very good interaction network of mm -hmm. transmission chains so i would expect to see a higher diversity of the you know of arena viruses yeah so so i can't really answer that because so far the we none of the python burmese pythons we've tested have been positive so um but it's been a fairly small number that I've, we've tested so um i think that's a it's an interesting idea but we just don't have data to to answer it one way or the other. Uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay, have you ever approached any of the breeding facilities, illegal or legal, and asked them if you could test any of the snakes? Because we've done this with parrot, parrots in in Poland, mm -hmm. and we've gone to breeding facilities, and they allowed us to test some of mm -hmm. them illegal, as long as we did not mention where they were located or who they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we did find is really, really good evidence that the breeding facilities were a hotspot mm -hmm. for virus recombination mm -hmm. because they were bringing these animals from different places. Yeah, we haven't, I haven't done that, but that's a, it's a good idea we should. There is definitely this degree of sensitivity where people don't want to be known for having, they don't want their identity known, and you have to, you have to be, the ones we've talked to have been pretty sensitive to that kind of thing. Um, my feeling is that that's probably true here too. We've when we were doing our experimental infection studies, we actually had a really hard time getting uninfected boa constrictors. So we actually got two batches of three snakes for our first attempt at the experimental infections, and five of the six snakes were already infected with a virus that we were hoping to infect them with. So there's clearly a really high prevalence in, in breeding operations and in captive snake populations. So um, I, my feeling is that if we were to do that, we would find the same thing. If there are no further questions, let's give Mark a Thank you. Thank you.